Good morning, everyone. Wherever you are, and hopefully you're all comfortable and sitting all cozy listening to the sermon. Uh, last week, we had about 70 people here and another 40 unit, family units on at home, which is really cool. And it was just nice to know our families there, that they're all still waiting and singing and, you know, it, it was just refreshing to know that there were so many people together. And I, I know it's a shame what has happened this week, but unfortunately, the, it's our team that is kind of trying to be tested and figure out what all is happening. So that makes a big difference. It just goes so fast. So we are so far doing well and everybody's testing okay. And uh, little by little, we'll get through all of this craziness. But I was so looking forward to having people in the audience <laughs> to speak to face to face. Um, and uh, it's, it's a little disappointing. I, I want to tell you, though, we have been receiving your notes and your cards. And I am so overwhelmed with the love that people have sent. And I we miss you. You know, I miss Rika. I miss... Susie, I miss everybody's smile and face and hugs. And when we get your cards, it's like being hugged by you. And I really appreciate all that people have extended to help us. We have been working very hard. It seems like we would be doing nothing at this time, but we are on the phone three and four hours a day alone, just, you know, trying to encourage and, and inspire and keep going. And I invite all of you to keep doing what you're doing. Keep calling each other. Keep sending notes and letters to each other. It's extraordinarily important. Send each other scriptures. And uh, anyway, so if you will pray with me, we'll begin. Precious Father in heaven, I ask that your Holy Spirit be with us. That you surround us with your angels. That from your throne high above all of this craziness, you sit enthroned by thousands of ten thousands of angels waiting to do your will. Draw near to us. Pull us up close to you. Let there be a spirit of Christmas in our home all over this place. And Father in heaven, I just ask you to give us the gift of your presence, your holy, sacred presence. Thank you so much for hearing this prayer and for all that you have done for our church this year. In Jesus' name, amen. I love Christmas. It's one of my favorite holidays. And this past week, I've been asking everybody that I could by phone or people, neighbors, you know, their favorite Christmases and what they remember and what they ate at Christmas time. And, you know, of course, there's the regular mashed potatoes, sweet potatoes, candied yams. You know, I kept hearing stories and then I would hear about mince pie. And um, I'm trying to think of all the different ones that came and went. Oh, there was a spice cake with a caramel sauce on it. And and people were talking about all the favorite things that were put together. And they were telling me about how um, there was an, uh, a couple that lives near us. And they were saying a long time ago they did not have uh, stockings. And they used to draw them. They would uh, draw them around their socks. And um, so they would do that, decorate it. And Santa would leave things, Santa would leave things on the stock paper stocking and it was always fruit and nuts and things like that and they didn't get a lot of gifts it was interesting to me that most of the people that talked to me about their joys of christmas didn't talk about all the presents that they got a lot of times they only got one or two little presents and maybe one big one and it was interesting to hear their their just just the things the cookie making and the things that they love so much um, I thought to my own Christmas, and I asked people, did you ever have a weird Christmas? Or do you ever remember your favorite gift? Or your, the weirdest gift you ever got? And 
one of my, we had so many around our Christmas because there was five kids and my mom and, you know, and my brother was always not only giving us weird gifts, but he, this, my poor brother had four sisters and a mom. He was the only guy in the house at the time. And my favorite memory of him is all of us going to Christmas, Christmas Eve, and he would not sit with us. He was just that stubborn. And he was not going to sit with us. My mom always sat in the second row, and she was always the shortest one among us. She looked like the kid, and we all looked like the adults because we were so tall. But my brother would not sit with us, so he sat in the very front row in front of us. Well, the problem is, is he never paid any attention to anything that was going on. And so we were all sitting there, and they were getting ready to sing, and all of a sudden, the choir stood up to sing their special music. And for some reason, my brother got it in his head that it was going to be a congregational song. So he stood up with the choir all by himself in front of the entire church. And my sisters and I became, <laughs> we're kind of <laughs> nudging each other like, we're going to wait till it dawns on him that this is not a congregational <laughs> song. And so the choir starts to sing. He continues to just stand there. And all of a sudden, he begins to turn around because they're singing. And as he turns around, the entire church is looking at him, which was just pure glory to us sisters that were sitting there like, hi, <laughs> you know, what you doing, Kurt? <laughs> you know? And so he was standing there all by himself looking and then all of a sudden he sat down <laughs> real fast and we were uncontainable. We had to leave the premise because we could not look at each other without completely bursting into almost tears of laughter. And then my brother, one by one, he liked to get us back. And he would do, this is my brother who was learning how to hunt. And uh, you have to understand, we, were, we did not grow up Seventh-day Adventist, and my brother was learning from the man across the street how to, to hunt, and he loved to play tricks on us. And so one Christmas, my brother started two weeks in telling my sister Joan that he couldn't wait for her to open the present that he got. It was absolutely perfect. And we were all like, what is it? What is it? You know, and we were so excited. We should have known. We should have known. But he kept saying, I can't believe I found the perfect gift for her. And so we waited. Well, it came time to open the presents. And no, his presents had to be, his presents had to be open last. And we're like, what? You know, so everybody opens things. And then we get down to the last gift. And it was a little bigger than a shoebox. And my sister Joan was so excited. And she sat there unwrapping this little, this present. And we were all like, what is it? What is it? She slow because she, she also decided to antagonize us and do this as slowly as possible. And as she began to open one side and then the other side, and then she just screamed and she threw it on the floor. I mean, like, spike in a basketball throwing on the floor we're like what and she was like oh oh and we all ran over and we opened it up and it was a cow skull that my brother had found he said I found the perfect gift he had found it on top of a mountain where he'd gone hunting and sometimes I guess that's where cows go when they die they they go up there and he had wrapped that up special for her he goes yeah Joni Boney and he goes, it matches. It's the perfect gift for you. She was like steam was coming out. She was so gross out and so mad at the same time. But then my brother also brought out another giant gift. And it was for my mom. And as she opened it, she just began to kind of squeal and scream. And, and she kept opening in it. And it was this beautiful antique chair it was this tiny little chair with no arms just a beautiful wood and he had found this and over the past month he had been learning how to 
refinished furniture and he had remade all the furniture and stained it and then he redid the cover that and it was this tiny little chair that was her perfect size and I never sat in that chair because that was mom's chair but here is, and she's like oh we're like oh you're the best brother except for Joan who is like you're the worst brother ever but my Christmases are always filled with all these stories and the things that we did and the places that we went and the sacrifice that our parents made for us, all of the crazy things that we did. But this, this is a weird Christmas. There are Christmases with great memories, but then there's weird Christmases. This is a weird Christmas, a Christmas where we're surrounded with pandemic where this week alone, the amount of people that died in one day was as many as those who died on 9-11. And that's a lot of families that are affected, a lot of hurt and pain. And now we have to be alone, and it's a weird Christmas. And I've had a lot of weird Christmases too, where I was overseas and couldn't be with my family. I've talked to a man who was in a submarine during Christmas, and he talked about how strange it was to not have any kind of Christmas and just be in this place all by yourself. I talked to a, a, one of my friends was telling me how she was so poor one year that they had taco, Chris, Christmas tacos. I think that's what, it, Christmas tacos. And I thought that was cute. But there are people that have had their families in the hospital. And I thought this year, how do we fight this? Because something happens, we feel sorry for ourselves. We start to feel lonely. We miss our families. We, it, it, it hurts. It feels sad. It doesn't feel the rejoicing. And I thought of an experience that I had with my daughter. Um this week when we went to Ecuador one of the first days that we were the very first day we were in Ecuador um, our students would all work half a day and because it was right at the equator and it's so hot that you can get sunstroke very easily so what we did was the kids worked half a day in the morning and then in the afternoon they could go do things and then we would switch them back and forth so that we didn't wear anybody out well, my daughter had her half day off in the morning and some, her and some of the other students went up to the mountain and they had rented four-wheelers and they were going to go up to um, a mountain and it was 14,000 feet up, this mountain next to us. And it overlooked behind us was a volcano. And if you went up the mountain, you could look over and see into the volcano. So several of the kids wanted to see that, and they took these four-wheelers. And, you know, we didn't even think about it that you're in a third-world country, so things are different. Um, the, the level of maintenance, the, the responsibility of a company if you wreck something is not the same. And so here they were going up and up and up, and uh, they got pretty high up. And one of my uh, student, my adoptive sons was riding, driving my daughter, and she was on the back. And all of a sudden, he realized he had no brakes. And uh, he, he was a big country farm boy, and he took that thing and he tried to, he couldn't stop it. And so he veered off and he went towards the mountain and he hit um, a ditch and it kind of catapulted my daughter and himself into the side of the cliff into the mountain and my daughter broke her pelvis so she was in bad shape and they weren't supposed to be up there nobody's supposed to be up there cars weren't supposed to be up there and about that time, a woman arrived, I guess, in a truck. And uh, the next time, the thing I knew is we were in the hotel, just arranging th things, working. And 
all of a sudden I see my daughter and she's there. She's being carried in by a group of guys that had gone up with her on their shoulders. She is hollering and she's covered in mud and she's in horrific pain. And I, it's like everything inside of me went crazy. It's like my daughter is broken. And we rushed her to the hospital. And again, we hadn't really thought through. This is a, you know, this hospital didn't have things like American hospitals. We went and we were so lucky because they actually did have an x-ray machine. We waited in the waiting room while dogs were walking around, which was a very interesting part of a hospital. And as the dogs were walking around and we were just waiting, it all of a sudden hit us. They're not going to, they don't know our insurance company. How are we going to pay for any of this? And we find out her pelvis is cracked. We go back to the hotel. And she, on top of it, had a cold, and she was coughing and coughing and coughing. And every time she coughed, she would be in, it would hurt more. So uh, that night, it was just this long, long day, a horrible day. And we had to give her medicine that we didn't know what it was. And we were sitting there, and she was coughing so bad that someone gave her some cough syrup. And it all of a sudden hit me, we have now given my daughter narcotics that we know nothing about and cough syrup. And um, it hit me, I have to, I'm going to have to stay awake. I'm going to have to watch her. And as the, day, the night went on and everybody went to bed, I realized if I lay down next to her that I'd fall asleep, that I was going to have to stay on my knees right next to her and put my head right next to her ear, my ear right next to her mouth. And I was going to have to listen for every breath all night long. The minute that she didn't breathe right, I was going to have to try to wake her up. And I sat there on my knees looking at my daughter who was completely out of it. And I just began to think of the mornings when she would wake up and I would put her in the bed between Sergio and I, and she'd have her little box of morning toys that she would play with when she was a baby. And I remember when she would come out of first grade with little whiskers drawn on her face. And I remember when she had her own country band and she, all of these things, these memories that flooded back. And I was like, this is my daughter, my precious daughter. And I'm listening for every breath and every now and then I couldn't hear it and I'd wake up or I'd find myself farting, starting to fall asleep and I would snap out of it because this is my daughter, my only daughter. And I love her so much and I will be broken forever if she dies, if she is injured badly. And we got, we, we got through the night. We had to leave Ecuador early, my daughter and I, and come back on the airplane. But that night changed everything in my mind because I started to realize is that Jesus is always his ear next to me, listening. And when I am overwhelmed with sin, and when I am disappointed in myself he's on my side he's on my side he's drawing near i i forgot to read my scripture to start so i do want to put i want to go ahead and read it now it's from luke i don't want to forget luke chapter 2 Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, 
Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. In the very hour when we are the most broken, and the very hour when we look upon ourselves and we have our, I mean, nobody has to tell us about our failing, our own self, within ourself, we feel guilty and ashamed of the things that are wrong. And in the very hour when history was most needing, God sends angels, flurries, huge amounts of angels draw near and he puts his ear to our mouth and he listens for our breath. He waits for that moment of spiritual knowledgement. He waits when we see ourselves as being naked and poor and miserable and failing over and over and we make all these promises that we're going, oh, we're going to study the Bible. Oh, we're going to do this and that. But then we just fail again and again and again. And Satan says, they're mine. They belong to me. And he he claims us. He claims us. And he blames us. And he rubs it in. But the blood of Christ is louder than that. And he waits. He sits by us saying, breathe. I'm here. I haven't left you. You mean everything to me. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't quit. He knows our heredity. He knows our laziness. He knows the things that are in us that we have not yet surrendered. Even when we think we're doing a good thing, we hurt people, we gossip, we do these things. I mean, I, I looked in this past year at myself and realized that the greatest sin are the things that come from my mouth or that I've hurt people and it breaks my heart in half. It breaks my, my spirit in half. And I come and I just don't even want to see Jesus when we are in these states where we really can't even bring ourselves and we get real busy so we don't have to be alone with Jesus. We get real busy or we drink or we do drugs or we whatever is the temptation because we do not want to see the reality of the motive of our heart, of the selfishness within us. And in this state, God can talk to us. It is in this place, it is when the world was dying that the Savior comes and that angels veiled from the sight of almost everybody but a bunch of shepherds. They draw near and they cheer and they say, this is good news. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. A great gift has been given you. He wants us to get alone with him. He wants us to tell us, I'm on your side. I understand what you're doing, but I, you will gain the victory. It will happen. Ron Halverson preached the most amazing sermon once I listened to when I was young. And he talked about how, uh, and Sergio's family does the same thing, that the brothers in their Italian family would all wait till Christmas Eve to go out and find their gifts. And in Sergio's family, her mother would make these amazing calzones. And so you'd come back after shopping very late and everybody would have these calzones and, 
it was, well, Ron Halverson's family, his dad and his two older brothers had gone to pick up all the presents and um, they said that uh, they were in the house decorating the tree and making a meal to eat and all of a sudden they heard noises, they saw ambulances, they saw lights, they heard uh, fire engines and loud and so they all ran downstairs to see what was going on and within a block of the house, um, there was a big car crash. And when Ron got there, it was um, his father. It was his father's car. And his father and all of his brothers were in there and very badly injured, very bad crash. And so they were all rushed to the hospital on Christmas Eve. And uh, they went in and very touch and go, very bad situation. But they somehow, all of them survived. So the next day, his mom and the rest of them thought, let's go get the presents out of the car and go to the hospital, and we'll have Christmas at the hospital. And he says they, as, uh, they took all the gifts from the car and brought them to the hospital, they began to realize that all the gifts had blood on them. And they realized that God had saved their family that the gift of God that year was that he saved them. And you have to understand that every gift that God gives us is covered in the blood of Christ. It has been paid for. It has been paid for by the very one who sits next to her ears and says, I'm on your side. Hold on. That is who paid. That has the blood. And I hope I remember the details of all the details of Ron's story. I'm sure he's probably written it in a book somewhere. For me, that's what I remember, and it deeply impressed me that we need to change the way we think because the gifts that we really want this year are the gifts that nobody can take away from us. You can lose your job. You can lose everything. You can be separated from your family and friends. You can. The world can go crazy. We're watching it. But the presence of God cannot be taken away from you. It is a gift. It is a gift by your Father who loves and adores you and remembers every little prayer you've ever prayed from the time you were a bitty child who has pity on all your weaknesses. The very presence of angels cannot be taken away from us. The Holy Spirit is a gift that cannot be taken. We, this Christmas, need to be alone and not be afraid to walk into what seems like a terrifying, to, to come before God and be undone and say, I am a sinner. It is me you came for. I'm the one. He comes to give us peace. He loves us with everything he has. And the angels recognizing what the, was being given to man stood there and were in awe because the religious leaders who should have been spreading these messages, who should have been telling people a long time ago that God is on your side, that he's on the side of sinners, that he's trying to save us. But instead of that, they missed the whole thing, and they, so the angels go right to the shepherds. They go to the people who are lowly because there is nothing in Jesus that attracts the powerful. There is nothing in Jesus that attracts us because we're going to get higher and higher and have better and better success. He didn't come for that because no amount of money, no amount of power can save your life from death. Only Jesus. That is the heavenly truth. That is the sacred oracle where angels came and tried to wake up men and say 
You must tell everybody. You must, because this is what will save you from your death. This was the great heaven opened, glorious angels shone. I don't, I can't even imagine what those shepherds, what a picture, what great picture was shown to, to man. And we, here is Jesus all veiled, all veiled. And a tiny, tiny baby in a manger. And we could not see the gift and what was being given to us. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. God forgives us. The gift that cannot be taken from you. Amen. No wonder they were singing because they saw what God was offering and we didn't deserve it. And they couldn't, they break out of eternity and show themselves singing this powerful song. You might be alone this Christmas. Whatever you have to do, break out a Christmas ball, maybe just one. Put on the music and sing loud. We must resist the apathy of this world. We must resist self-pity because we have been given such a great gift. I want to read the second piece of scripture and then I'm going to uh, read a poem at the end. So it says, this is from Luke chapter 1, verse 68. Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies, amen, amen, and from the hand of all who hate us. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And you, child, speaking to John the Baptist, but greater than that, more prophetic than that, he is speaking to us. This is the commission. And to you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways and to give knowledge of salvation to his people. We have been called with a sacred oracle to give a knowledge to people that God has forgiven them, that he hasn't given up, that he's still listening, he's still waiting. to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins. Though tender of mercy of our, through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and a shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. You and I have a commission we have been called to stand up with angels and to sing these songs and hark the herald angels sing glory to the coming king jesus is coming and we have the privilege of singing with heavenly host a sacred commission to give and i want to end i've read this before to you i wrote it years ago but as every time I get asked to <laughs> do this at Christmas, I'm going to read it. <laughs> Dear Jesus, 
Around my mind is wrapped the memories of 30-some Christmases. Cold mornings so thrilling that you hardly got your socks on before you were under the tree. There was the smell of Grandma's hot chocolatey cookies hanging on the curtains and the sugar cookie dough still stuck on the sides of the table, as well as an escaped cinnamon candy or silver sparkle from the cooking session the night before. Always, always there was a tangerine in the toe of my stocking, always. I could depend on it throughout richness and poverty, divorce and teenage years. There was always a tangerine in the toe. I love the feeling of my crisp red velvet dress and the shine of my clackety black patent leather shoes. Church was always filled with poinsettias and white candles with songs whispering in the halls. Little angels with tinfoil halos and miniature wise men all did their parts in the play. My grandmother would occupy us for hours cracking black walnuts with bricks on the sidewalk out front. And I hated plucking the headless goose. I'm still a vegetarian because of that one chore alone, I think. When we had all of our fill of mint jelly, three kinds of potatoes, greens and stuffings, and two kinds of rolls, and spiced peaches and pies and cakes and candies, and we would hide from the mountain of dishes that followed. The men, of course, would discuss politics in the den. But all of us kids knew. I called it dignified dish ducking. It was hiding nevertheless. As I got older and would sit amongst the torn and unraveled piles of wrapping paper, a growing disappointment would come. I felt let down each year because I began to look for that, that one giant present that would say it all, that one exquisite gift that would tell me that I was loved, truly loved. As I got older, the gifts got smaller and fewer. Conversely, the world's message to me seemed louder. I couldn't run as fast. I couldn't jump as high. I couldn't shine as bright. There was always the beautiful and the outgoing to keep up with. Maybe I was too sensitive for this world, but I was too vile for the next. Where was that present that would say, I was valuable. And then one Christmas morning, with all the tinsel and the blinking lights behind, I ventured out in the snow. Before the sun came up in the spotlight of someone's front yard, I found a life-size manger. I closed my eyes and I could almost imagine a real baby Jesus there. Oh Jesus, how fair you must have been. Could I hold God wrapped up in a tiny body so frail, so vulnerable like me? Could I open your hands and kiss your little fingers before healing poured from them and before nails pierced them? Could I brush the downy soft hair and brow before it was torn by thorns of hate? Oh, sweet, worried brow, could I but touch the feet and the tiny baby toes before they traveled their blood-stained path? Oh, frame so small, so breakable, so innocent, so unprotected, as your last words called for your father dear, I'm sure your first were for him if I could but hear. All of heaven in my arms, wrapped in soft pink baby charms. All his love and sacrifice, all his desires and motives true were all for me and they're all for you. Oh, Jesus, would you let me rock you slow, and would you sleep before your long journey go? Thank you for my present, dear. 
please always do stay near. I love you too. And when your trial is over, and my trial is over, we will meet again. And you will be the king. Will you hold me then? Thank you for the present. Have a peaceful, wonderful Christmas. We are thinking of you. We are praying for you. Tell everybody Jesus has forgiven us and that he's right next to us, counting every breath, listening for life. Dear friends, we have a great commission this Christmas. Say it loud, however you can get it out there. Thank you for tuning in and coming to our church. And we have a beautiful Christmas song we would like to end with, my dear friend. child prays for peace on earth and it's calling out from a sea of hurt oh come oh come Emmanuel and can you hear the angels
Amen. That song was perfect. If you will pray with me. Heavenly Father, we don't know how to come to you, and we just, we just come all messed up. We're afraid to look you in the face. And we ask that you help us. Help us to be alone with you this Christmas. Help us to appreciate the gifts you have given. Send us to people who have never heard this message. Bless us as we are far from each other. Help us to hold on to each other. Dear Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you for not letting go. Thank you for staying near and listening and hoping and waiting. We love you, Jesus. We love you, God. We love you. Thank you for all of that you have done, for your angels, for your glory that you show us, for never letting go. Dear Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs>